Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the poem Sing Song by Daljeet Nagra. But first let me share the overriding contextual information that might be handy about this poet. So, Nagra writes within and against the English conventions as a poet. His poem actually comes from his breakthrough collection called Look We Have Coming to Dover. You'll notice, just by hearing what that collection sounds like in its title, he writes with words that are spelt phonetically in Punjabi-inflected English vernacular, or at least that's what critic Eric Falke describes it as. Basically, I like to call it Pumblish, because it sounds a bit like Punjabi mixed with English. This particular poem focuses on a speaker who is passionately and madly in love with their bride, but also considers the speaker's broader relationship with his family and his customers as he runs a corner shop. The language of this poem highlights the merging of cultures and also raises some important questions about the stereotypes that are both mentioned and shattered in this poem. The title itself, Sing Song, puts a cultural spin on a traditional English sing song which is often associated with war times and people making best of a bad situation. It's also a pun on the word sing, which all Sikh men have in their names. And it actually comes from the traditional language Punjabi and it means lion and honour. Additionally, I think it's important to acknowledge that Sing Song as a poem is a dramatic monologue, which is joyous, energetic and ultimately highlights this joyous cultural hybrid. To make full use of what Daljeet Nagra is trying to convey, unfortunately, against my best wishes, I'm going to have to don an Indian accent. So I'd like to apologise to all those of you listening who are of an Asian heritage and have a much better, much more fluid sense of what accents sound like. This is my best attempt to bring to life the poem and I apologise in advance. I run just one of my daddy's shops from nine o'clock to nine o'clock and they want me not to have a break but when nobody in, I do the lock. Cause up the stairs is my newly bride. We share in chapati, we share in the chutney. After we have made love like we are rowing through Patni. When I return with my penny untied, the shoppers always point and cry. Hey, sing, where you been? Your lemons are limes, your bananas are plantain. This dirty little floor need a little bit of mop. In the worst Indian shop on the whole Indian road. Above my head, high heel tap the ground, as my wife on the web is playing with the mouse. When she netting to cat on her sick lover side, she booked them for the meat at the cheese of her price. My bride, she effing at my mum in all the colours of Punjabi, then stumble like a drunk making fun at my daddy. My bride, tiny eyes of a gun and the tummy of a daddy. My bride, she have a red kuru cat, she wear a tartan sari, a donkey jacket and some pumps, and on the squeak of the girls that are pinching my sweeties. When I return from the tickle of my bride, the shoppers always point and cry, Hey, sing, where you been? The milk is out of date and the bread is always stale and the things you have on offer you never have not got in stock in the worst Indian shop on the whole Indian road. Late in the midnight hour, when your shoppers are wrapped up quiet, when the precinct is concrete cool, we come down whispering stairs and sit on my silver stool. From behind the toppled bars, we stare past the half price window signs at the beaches of the UK in the brighty moon. From the stool each night, she say, how much do you charge for that moon baby? From the stool each night I say is half the cost of you baby. From the stool each night she say how much does that come to baby? From the stool each night I say is priceless baby. And I just want to apologise straight away before I go any further. Well done if you've enjoyed listening to my uh, somewhat haphazard interpretation of the voice that would be donned with this poem. Please watch on if you actually want to learn what might be going on. The first thing that catches our eye is definitely that this speaker defies the conventions of the stereotype, that of the hard-working, diligent Indian son. Because for the first line, we realise he's only looking after one of his family's businesses. It's as if he's not really trusted. The opening stanza also highlights that he shuts the shop when he can't see any customers, 
which is actually against what his dad wants. His dad's told him he shouldn't take breaks, but clearly he's a little bit on the deviant side. As I mentioned earlier, this is really an interesting mix of Punjabi English, because as opposed to using standard English, we hear words that are of, runt, ven, have, de, which are spelt phonetically, and we realise there is the omission of articles like a and an in this uh, whole rendition of the poem. When we move on to stanza two, we realise the major distraction that means our speaker wants to get away from the shop is actually his newly bride. There is absolutely no privacy in the simile that he uses toward the end of second stanza. There's quite a frank relish of his really quite vigorous sexual pleasures with the image of them rowing uh, through Putney. That's a very fast moving action, which really shows how much he's enjoying the physical side of his relationship. As we move on though, the frustration of the customers seems to me anyway to echo society's disapproval of him leaving the shop. Hey Sing, where you been? And they also seem to continue this resentment. There's a comic tone of the stanza ending in this kind of infamous label that this is the worst Indian shop on the whole of the Indian road. It's as if to say, there are lots of reasons why this shop is rubbish. For a start, the lemons are limes, the bananas are plantain, the floor is dirty and it needs a mop. But we see this contradiction because Stanzas one and then three show us that he should be thinking of his business, but as we've already seen, stanza two concentrates more on his bride, as does stanza four, and we realise that he has so many distractions to balance. His wife, as we learn in the fourth section of this poem, is the opposite of a modest and well-behaved uh, domestic woman. We realise that she's online, on the web, looking at dating sites, well, I suppose that's the 21st century approach to an arranged marriage. And she's matchmaking these Sikh lovers to get them to meet up. I like the pun of mouse when he's talking about her playing with the mouse and that she's acting like a cat. And this pun on meat, as in uh, the, the edible kind, but actually he means the homophone, to meet. As we go through to this next section of the poem, we realise just how controversial this bride is. She fails to respect her mother and father-in-law. Instead of actually being polite, as we might expect someone to behave with their in-laws, she swears at her mum in all the colours of Punjabi. Well, this is her mother-in-law, but still it's incredibly rude. And not only that, the father figure, the head of the household, she laughs at his father, stumbles like a drunk, it says, and he's, she's making fun of him. But more than anything, we understand that she's quite an unusual beauty in the middle of the section of this uh, slide anyway. She's got the eyes of a gun, which makes her sound quite aggressive, yet we also get the impression with her tummy of a teddy that she's quite a cuddly character. Across this section, the repetition of my bride in the possessive my highlights how much our speaker is A, in love, and B, seemingly quite proud of his wife. I think it's interesting in the final section of this particular slide, when we look at um, the description of what she's wearing, she definitely seems like a bit of a rebel. She's got quite an edgy sense of style, um, which is both her Scottish and Indian style sari, which is in tartan, a Scottish print, alongside quite a masculine looking jacket that is described as a donkey jacket. She's got a, quite a formal sort of hard line haircut. It's called a crew cut that sounds quite masculine. And she's also got these pumps, which seem quite informal. Yet the most important thing, I think, if we look at her identity through her clothing, is that she's still wearing a sari. So she's not totally detached from her original culture. More than anything, by this point in the poem, husband and wife seem like a very odd, unique and idiosyncratic couple. And the more we read about them, the more funny they seem and the more hilarious. This next so moment in the poem reminds us that this is more like a song. We can hear the voices and the disharmony around the speaker, his wife, and even the customers. Each voice in this poem has its own moment in the song, whether it's in a solo, in a duet, or really in the form of the customers in their chorus. The repetition of phrases that we've heard before, like Venai and My Bride, add to the sound effects of this harmony. 
I like the comedy of the repetition of in the worst Indian shop on the whole Indian road. It just emphasises he's a rubbish shop assistant. In fact, the milk is out of date, the bread is always stale, and you never have in stock what you say you've got on offer. He sounds awful. But on top of that sense of things not being well put together, the English language mixed with Indian pronunciation leads to this really inter entertaining and quite rich poem where the sounds mirror our enthusiasm to find out more about what's going on with our speaker. So let's take, for example, here. If you wanted to see a moment in the poem full of enjambement, well, this poem is stuffed with enjambement because that destructural device of not using punctuation so readily to finalise a line or a stanza helps to generate this ideal of words pushing through with their own power. And it's full of energy and momentum and it matches our speaker's enthusiasm and passion for life. The comic images that we get here of our speaker after hours as, as the poem gets slower of what happens when we're all wrapped up quiet in our houses, when the precinct is concrete cool with no one there. The idea that they go downstairs and they sit on the silver stool and they sit from behind where the chocolate bars are and they stare past the half price window signs and they look out the beach of the UK in the brighty moon. It sounds hilarious. But it also adds something of the mood as this poem begins to slow down. Just a point of information that's not so much particular to one section of this poem. But it's interesting to note that the most commonly used piece of punctuation across the whole poem, as is the last thing on this particular slide, is the hyphen. And I think that adds to the sense of energy and flow. Nothing can stop it. It's constantly continuing.